Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming on in and seeing this talk. Why scale up is like Star Trek and scale out is like Star Wars. Um, before I begin, a few program notes. Um, this is a new presentation, and I would invite, um, especially towards the end, if people can think of other examples that I may have missed or things that I might have gotten wrong, by all means, feel free to chip in. I would like your feedback on this presentation and how it worked. Um, and I'll tell you why, a little bit more why about that in the actual presentation. Also, program note number two. We are going to be talking about things that are deep and meaningful to us as geeks, and Star Trek and Star Wars are certainly a part of that ecosystem. If I do something wrong, please do not correct me. Don't be the guy that tries to explain warp drives to anybody, okay, or hyperspace, okay? I know these are important things, seriously, but let's just we'll let it go, move on, and you can come you can come talk to me later and I will, you know, I'll build it in. I will listen to you, just let's let's not get into the weeds a little bit too. Also, finally, program note number three. Apparently I am the active target of a practical joke, um, which may be um, implemented during this presentation. If such an uh, event does occur, please keep your hands and arms inside the vehicle at all times, and we'll just write it out, and everything will be fine. So hopefully, you know, I have no idea what to expect, but we'll see. All right, so a little bit about this talk and why we're having it. So my, na uh, my name is Brian Prophet. I am the community liaison for Overt. Overt is an open source project um, sponsored by Red Hat that is primarily designed to be a virtual machine manager. Plenty of seats up front, come on in if you wanna swing on in or, you know, hang out. Um, and with Overt, we, you know, do scaling. We can manage anywhere from two to 2,000 virtual machines at any one time. We also have other projects in Red Hat's um, umbrella like RDO, which is our cloud, our o OpenStack um, um, implementation that does scaling too. So we're all, you know, talking about scaling up and scaling out quite a bit. And as we go through this presentation, it kind of occurred to me there are different ways of talking about this, different stories, different ideas that we can tell, uh, use to tell and explain what we're doing. So let's start at the very beginning. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay, I've got a range here. All right, here we go. So I'll move over here. So in the beginning, there was the computer. We took sand and metal and rocks. We built them and we forged them into one wonderful machine. We took mathematical concepts and we turned them into code and turned that into information and data exchange. And life was good. And also in the beginning, we had one operating system for one machine. And that too was good. Life was fine. Everything was cool. You had your machine, you told it what you needed, it gave you it back. You did not need to scale. In some respects, in the early days, we were told that there would never be more than 10 IBM computers in the entire world, okay? That may have been a little wrong, but the, the theory was there. We didn't need scalability at that point. Everything was good. And we were happy, we were satisfied, and we danced to weird alien pop music, and things were all right. But things were a little clunky. Interfaces were, you know, a little archaic. We didn't really, you know, understand sometimes what we were going to be doing. Sometimes we had a little information overload. So it wasn't entirely perfect. Things had to change. And change they did. Sometimes the changes were good, and sometimes they were weird, and Apple's story. Um, but, you know, basically things had to move along. We learned about virtualization. And with virtualization, the game changed. Because suddenly you didn't have to have one operating system per machine. You could have multiple operating systems per machine. And that led to scalability. First, we had it in data centers and using tools like, you know, Overt and Proxmox and VMware vSphere, if you want to go proprietary land. 
you can you know use those tools to manage your virtual machines in a data center. And then around about the same time, somebody figured out how to automate it. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> like, what could I use? Hmm. And 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 we learned to automate the the applications inside our servers um, were you know retooled to automate themselves and start asking for resources and spin them up and spin them down and scale automatically and elastically. And that became what we know um, as cloud computing, which is really another metaphor in and of itself. And as we were trying to do this and explain this, it became clear that there were a lot of people who were not too terribly sure about how you scale. So no, lo, there came a metaphor. And this is what the core of this discussion is about. How we in IT use metaphors and stories to get across what we're doing. Not only the tools themselves, which is what this talk is about, we're talking about the tools that allow us to scale and how we scale, but actually what's going on inside. Everything that we do in IT is a story from the metaphor of here's a window and here's a menu um, to in a spreadsheet, as I was saying earlier, you know, in a spreadsheet, that's the whole application, whether it's Excel or Calc or whatever, is a metaphor based on a physical book that accountants used to use to keep records. Okay, and that's why we have to deal with things like worksheets and workbooks as descriptors of spreadsheets, okay? And as we were going, I was going through this talk um, and building it, it occurred to me that we, and I'll probably do this later, There's, you can build a whole thing about the stories that we um, in IT tell. And people call us nerds and geeks and not creative in any way, but in some ways we are probably among the most creative human beings on the planet because we're taking math and, you know, machines and communicating and building stories with those. But moving on, the specific metaphor that I wanted to talk about is the metaphor that was brought up uh, initially by Randy Bias from Cloudscape, okay? And that is the difference between explaining scale up and scale um, out. And Randy Bias said that scaling up, building your machines to more powerful levels so that they could, you know, grow and be more powerful and handle your application workloads that way, that they were like pets. Like our friend the Rancor here, you know, so cute. I, tr I tried so hard to find this screenshot of the guy crying, and it was, it was so hard. Um, but, yeah, okay, pet. Okay. That, you know, that's one way of scaling up. We build more powerful machines. Not as many, but, you know, they're big and beefy and powerful. And, you know, sometimes they eat things like they too much. But, you know, it, it all worked out pretty well. So that's scaling up. That's the metaphor that Randy Bias came up with. He does uh, attribute that to Bill Baker, um, who I believe works for, I want to say the DOD. Um, so that's where the pet metaphor came from. And the other half of the metaphor is scaling out with cattle. Couldn't find any Star Trek cattle. <laughs> but I thought Tribbles would do just as well. Clearly a classic case of scaling out. You feed the little things and they're all over your place. Somebody shut that door. Um, cattle. This describes the scale out um, methodology where you have many smaller identical machines, you spread them out and work your application across many machines, and that handles your workload. That's the scale out model. And so that worked for a while, but when I was doing this, I would always, as a joke, and I have a lot of friends who are legitimate vegetarians and vegans. My own daughter is a vegetarian. 
And so I would also say, okay, for the vegetarians among you, because I am a smart aleck, okay, I would say, think of it like this. Scaling, scaling out is like a wheat farm where you've got a zillion acres of wheat, and scaling up is like growing your own heirloom tomatoes, which are wonderful and but delicious and small, but you've got to put a lot of effort into them, and you get awesome tomatoes. I'm like, um, um, except for some people who, yeah, hate tomatoes, but... <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I would do that because you know I'm trying to be Mr. Sensitive. I'm trying to say, okay, you know, let's let's take care of the vegetarians in the crowd because when we talk about cattle, we're talking about you know food, and uh, that can get a little awkward. So, but yeah, so but then I thought, okay, what do we know? Of, what do we as geeks know about such things? What do we know of pets and cattle? You know, I know about cattle because my father-in-law is a farmer, but, you know, that doesn't always equate. And, you know, not all of us are gardeners or anything like that. We've got our own interests, our own way of looking at the world that are diverse and curious to the outside world. But they still sort of, you know, they're really valid ways of thinking about the world around us. So I thought to myself, maybe, perhaps, in a galaxy far, far away, or in the final frontier, that we actually had a different way of explaining this to people. How do we explain this to ourselves and the people around us? So this is what this talk will do. We will try to explain scaling out and scaling up in a, in a way that is within this broader metaphor of Star Wars and Star Trek, or we will die trying. <laughs> and actually, when I say we, I mean me. And if the, if the hook comes out, you know, we're, we're in trouble. All right. So the first way I thought about this is, and this is pretty much the easier way to do this. I was thinking about the way each one of these fictional, and I did say fictional, just so we're clear, um, universes deals with things like their ship. Okay? Now, in Star Trek, and especially in the original series, which is, you know, pretty much where it all began and should be the canon, but then J.J. Abrams came along and ruined it. <laughs> um, but I'm not bitter, not at all. Oh. Um, there weren't a lot of ships. Okay, I know this diagram doesn't do a really good job but of, of saying that because, you know, you've got all these little different classifications and things like that and whatever, but... Um, but um, you um, don't have a lot of ships. In the original Star Trek series, the Enterprise was one of 12 Constitution-class starships, okay? And that was pretty much it. And there were other ships implied in Starfleet and whatnot, so it wasn't just 12, but clearly there weren't a lot, you know, flying around at Warp 9 or whatever the engines couldn't handle that particular weight. And the ships in Star Trek are interesting because they are truly multi-purpose machines, okay? Um, the Constitution ships and the other ones that came later, the Excelsior class and everything like that, these are very multi-purpose um, vessels. They were built for exploration. They were built for defense. They were built for, um, you know, uh, diplomatic missions and cargo runs and things like that. They had a lot. They even had a flight deck, which if you think about it, why do you need a flight deck when you have a transporter? But oh well, <laughs> plot device. Um, so, yeah, I get a little grumpy about that. So, okay. But they're multi-purpose. They are really truly a classic example of scaling up. You have a few very flexible platforms that are powerful enough to do the jobs that you need to do. Also, a particular uh, a peculiarity about Star Trek ships was the investment put into the crews. Crews were designed to be very, you know, strong, unified bodies to do their jobs. Their, uh, you know, cooperation was encouraged skill sets were um, very much enhanced and taken advantage of. Um, next Generation was interesting to me because if you think about this, 
really think about this? These were basically superheroes running around. I mean, because really, you had the brainy android with the superpower of thinking really fast. You had the empath with her superpower who could apparently read minds um, 50,000 miles away at some point. So, okay. Um, and they're super strong Klingon. I mean, you had, you know, your own Justice League sitting in the Enterprise. Um, so there's mixed metaphors there for sure. But the thing about that was there was a lot of investment. They spent a lot of time and effort building on each other's strengths, playing off each other's strengths, and working from there. Well, almost. Um, <laughs> there was some exception. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, when Kirk, when somebody was about, you know, died, you know, he was really upset, you know. There's a lot of investment in the crew. He wanted to take care of everybody on the ship and, you know, was genuinely upset when things went wrong, um, this meme notwithstanding. Um, so there you go. From the ship aspect, this is why Star Trek is a really good way of explaining scale up methodology. Now let's move over to the other universe, a long time ago and a far, far away. Star Wars ships. Never really, you know, know exactly how many ships are running around. We didn't spend a lot of time on detail, but clearly there is a bazillion of them, which is a technical number. So let's be all clear about that. Okay, from TIE fighters to Imperial Star Destroyers, to whatever the heck that giant thing uh, Darth Vader was driving around. Okay, there were a lot of these things. And they were practically, on the Empire side, basically chase and run anything down that it possibly could and kill it. Okay, with the TIE Fighters as well. There, were, uh, there didn't seem to be any Imperial Science Division running around. It was basically a bunch of guys in plastic armor running around shooting people. Very singular in purpose. Crew investment was a little bit different. But because there wasn't really an a, a interest in diversity of, of skill sets, in fact, there was so much not diversity of interest, they started cloning the people. I mean, seriously, who does that? Because if I think to myself, if you want more than one of me out there, you've got serious problems. <laughs> and I'm sorry, guys, but that may apply to some of you as well. Okay? I'm just saying. So, yeah, crew investment was a totally different thing. We were talking about basically making 